Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am Matt Abbott, the Director of Government and Diplomatic Programs at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. I would like to welcome Professor Toshihiro Nakayama to Chicago and to the Council's platform. I will also, I would like to thank Japanese Consul General Naoki Ito for his, and his wonderful team at the consulate for their assistance with this program. This year, the consulate will be celebrating their 120th anniversary, and we're honored to welcome the professor as part of that celebration. This afternoon, we are on the record and live streaming. Please make sure to silence your phones, but we welcome your engagement on social media. Also, we will take audience questions via microphone in the room, but we also welcome the submission of questions by our live stream audience, which can be done by typing chi.cnf.io into your web browser. For nearly a century, the Chicago Council on Global Affairs has provided an independent, nonpartisan platform for a variety of different perspectives to promote deeper global understanding and active US engagement in the world. Views expressed by individuals we host are their own and do not represent institutional positions or views of the council. As well, the council is a membership organization. If you are a member, we thank you for your support, which helps us to continue to produce affordable, accessible, and independent content. Turning back to today, we are pleased to welcome Professor Nakayama as we resume our programming for a new season. Toshihiro Nakayama is Professor of American Politics and Foreign Policy at Keio University. He is also an adjunct fellow at the Japan Institute of International Affairs. He previously served as a special correspondent for the Washington Post and the Far Eastern Bureau and a special assistant at the Permanent Mission of Japan to the United Nations in New York. After his remarks, the professor will be joined in conversation by Carl Friedhoff. Carl is fellow in public opinion and foreign policy at the council. He was previously based in Seoul where he worked in the public opinion studies program at the Asan Institute for Policy Studies. He completed his undergraduate work at Wittenberg University and his graduate work at Seoul National University. Now please join me in welcoming Professor Toshihiro Nakayama. Well, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Toshi Nakayama. I uh, teach American politics and foreign policy at the uh, a private institution, Keio University in Japan. And it, uh, it has become a difficult sort of topic uh, these days, uh, you know, convincing my students. Because I guess uh, many of us uh, are, uh, I was totally wrong about the election, so I uh, lost credibility among my students as, as a specialist on American politics and foreign policy. Uh, it, it's an honor to be here. Uh, in fact, I was a, a colleague with Ambassador Dalder a couple of years back when I was at, the, <clears throat> at a Brookings Institution uh, as a visiting fellow. I don't know whether <clears throat> you remember me or not, but uh, uh, <clears throat> thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, and uh, in fact, I have visited uh, 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 the council when it was still Chicago Council on, on uh, Foreign Affairs. Uh, 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 th this was when uh, the, the institute that, that I belong to, Japan Institute of International Affairs, was trying to sort of uh, do the same kind of polling studies that, that uh, this council has been producing since the, uh, the 70s. Uh, but we understand, we understood then that you need an sort of extraordinary amount of expertise, work, and money, and the institute, my institute, decided that, that we don't, so we sort of abandoned that project. But I, I really sort of admire and uh, uh, sort of use uh, the uh, the polling studies, and it, it has become a uh, sort of a public good among the uh, sort of scholars whose whose focus is on uh, you know international relations and foreign policy. And today I, I come here to talk about the other sort of public good, which is the uh, you know the American commitment uh, to you know global affairs and the commitment to the alliances, and in particular, in our, in our case, uh, you know, the U.S.-Japan alliance. Uh, you know, Japan, I think, faces uh, four challenges, I would say. You know, they're, they're all sort of interconnected, but sort of just for the sake of uh, convenience, I will sort of separate these four. You know, the first one is the, uh, the challenge in the, in the global sphere, global sphere, the result of, you know, hyper-connectivity, dealing with the sort of the dark side of the globalization, you know, uh, climate change, uh, uh, trade, shock in financial markets, cyber, pandemic, space, and all that. And then the second cluster is the regional challenge. And of course, you know, the, what, what dominates the news uh, uh, coming from Northeast Asia is 
the threat on Korean Peninsula. So that's a direct and uh, sort of a short-term serious challenge. But also in a mid to sort of long-term challenge that we're facing is the uncertain uh, sort of a, a direction of uh, where China is going. And that sometimes makes us uh, you know, ex uh, you know, extremely worried. So that's, that regional challenge is, is the, the second challenge. And of course, we, like any other uh, countries, we do have our uh, domestic challenges. Uh, we have been dealing with the sort of the, uh, you know, the, uh, the disasters of East Japan Great Earthquake. Uh, but we, 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 you know, the wounds would remain. But now sort of, um, we're sort of marching sort of forward to prepare for the 2020 Olympics. Uh, you know, in, in terms of, you know, political leadership, I would say Prime Minister Abe's uh, sort, of, uh, uh, sort of leadership is one of the most stable leadership among the Western democracies. Fortunately, uh, we don't have, we don't see uh, a, a, a rise of sort of this negative populism in Japan, whereas, you know, in other Western countries they do. Uh, that's partly because Japan is a, a homogenous society. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, it, it's good that we're not facing that issue. And uh, lastly, the fourth challenge, or maybe, <clears throat> maybe it's, it's more accurate to sort of uh, uh, call that, uh, you know, our worries or, 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 you know, is that, you know, how America would engage globally, uh, how it sees uh, Asia Pacific, and how uh, it sees you know, the U.S.-Japan alliance. What, what, what kind of relations, relationship does US, the U.S. wants to establish with Japan? <clears throat> and uh, uh, this is a serious, uh, you know, uh, a challenge or a worry about Japan. If you sort of uh, think back uh, about what Mr. Trump was saying uh, uh, about Japan during the election, uh, it, was, it was quite shocking for us. Uh, he's on trade. He sort of lumped sort of Japan together with Mexico and China and said Japan is a cheater. Uh, and he said he would withdraw from TPP, which he did. Uh, and in terms of national security, this isn't the precise word he, he used, but that's the message that we received. He says that, you know, U.S. protects Japan. And if Japan wants to be protected, you have to pay. That was the blunt message that we felt like we were hearing. And in terms of, you know, uh, sort of nuclear weapons, he's, well, to be fair, he said this only once, so maybe we should, I shouldn't be exaggerating this too much, but he said Japan can go nuclear if you want. So that was the kind of uh, a message we received, and that made us extremely worried. Uh, you know, but our sense was that, you know, more or less, things would continue in the form of, you know, Clinton administration. So let me go back to sort of U.S.-Japan relations during the Obama era. Uh, you know, Obama administration, and I have to be careful because I understand he's, he's uh, Chicago's favorite son, but he's not known to be achieving too much sort of uh, uh, on sort of the strategic front. Rather, he's often uh, been criticized for that. But in terms of U.S.-Japan relations, I think uh, it has uh, uh, made a major sort of uh, a forward leap uh, under the leadership of uh, Prime Minister Abe and President Obama at a symbolic level and at a policy level as well. A symbolic level, of course, you know, his, his visit to Hiroshima and Prime Minister's visit to uh, uh, you know, Pearl Harbor, that was significant. In terms of policy, there were many policy developments that Japan sort of undertook, you know, establishing the National Security Council, drafting the National Security Strategy, uh, dealing with self, uh, collective self-defense and all that, and they were all endorsed by President Obama, and that was really good. Uh, but at the same time, there was this a, a bit of a worry about, and, and no doubt, he, I would say he is the most intellectually sophisticated president that you have in a long time. His world, his view of the world is very sophisticated, but at the same time, at least many on the Japanese sort of uh, side, although what he did on the alliance was, was pitch perfect, there was the sense that he was, you know, a, a detached and a bit aloof, and the actions he took on Syria and Crimea made us worried, although we totally understand the situation in Syria and situation in Crimea and the, the situation that we're facing in North, Northeast Asia is, is totally different. That made us a bit uh, nervous. So if you compare President Obama and uh, Senator Clinton or, or, or Secretary Clinton, 
Secretary Clinton represented more of a traditional sort of American power type of politician. At least that was our sense. So she had just the right mix of this hawkishness and belief in sort of, you know, good old sort of traditional diplomacy. And of course, the fact that she was the architect of the pivot and the rebalance uh, helped her image a lot. So what we thought was that, you know, the U.S.-Japan uh, relations, uh, uh, the alliance, uh, would be even better under uh, the uh, Clinton-Abe leadership. Uh, but of course, you know, uh, that didn't happen, and we had, we, have to sort of, we had to deal with, you know, how we would deal with uh, this relations uh, under Mr. Trump. Uh, uh, but we never thought, uh, you know, he would win. So back in September of 2016, when uh, uh, Prime Minister Abe visited New York to, to attend the General Assembly uh, at the United Nations. Uh, he met candidate Hillary without uh, meeting uh, candidate Trump. Uh, and that seemed totally natural. So when the election results came in, we were quite shocked. And we were faced with the challenge that maybe this relations and this alliance might be facing a fundamental challenge. And, and the anxiety was quite huge. And that's what prompted Prime Minister Abe to go to Trump Tower in uh, mid-November. Uh, and this was, was a bit unusual to, to go and see President-elect. But uh, you know, that shows how worried we were. And that meeting sort of seemed somehow sort of worked out. And after that, he stopped sort of tweeting about Japan. I think he tweeted uh, uh, during his election and uh, inauguration. I think he uh, tweeted once or twice about Toyota, but that was about it. But the anxiety remained. So uh, right after the inauguration, if you ask the Japanese people, would uh, sort of U.S.-Japan relations worsen uh, under uh, President Trump? 55% answered yes. And if you ask the Japanese people then, would the America first sort of uh, thinking uh, have a negative effect on sort of international affairs. 84% said uh, yes. So this, this number is quite staggering because uh, Japan is one of the most uh, pro-American nations uh, on earth, literally. You know, Philippines beat us. They support you by like 90%. Right? If you ask the Japanese public, do you feel affinity towards, towards the United States? The answer would be constantly over 80%. And a constant 80% is not what you usually get in a democracy. Okay? Uh, but in a, but this, this image of US, at least at the uh, sort of in inauguration of Mr. Trump, has uh, uh, faced a serious challenge. And, and uh, you know, in fact, it has changed dramatically. But then again, if you look at Japan carefully, you don't see this you know, anti-American, anti-Trump kind of social phenomena that you see in Europe. It does not exist. Uh, you know, Chancellor Merkel, uh, Merkel said she can say that we have to rely, we, we have to stop relying on others. Right? She said that publicly, although it was during the election. And right after the election, uh, President Macron said that, you know, let's make America, uh, Earth great again, which the message is quite clear. But can a Japanese leader say that? Is it a responsible action for a Jap Japanese leader to say so? I don't think so. Uh, you know, because if you look at the situation that we're facing in our region, you know, the, the issues on Korean Peninsula and the uncertain rise of China, there's a sense in Japan that US and Japan is on the same plane. And if you're on the same plane, you have to root for the pilot. It's, I guess, simple as that. So our decision was to adapt rather than to complain. I think that was a, a, a clear decision. So as a result of that decision, uh, back in February, Prime Minister Abe decided to sort of uh, go to Washington and then sort of follow him, Mr. Trump, to Florida. And I would say embraced Mr. Trump fully without any hesitation. They, uh, they, they dined five times together. They played ten, uh, 27 holes of golf together. Can I be proud of that? No. So there's some question marks. But as a Japanese leader, I think he no doubt did the right thing. And what is the result? Uh, in terms of US-Japan alliance and relations, Mr. Trump has said all the things that, you know, 
that we wanted him to say. Uh, there's a sense that you know, even he went much further than uh, President Obama. And on TPP, on, on an economic sort of matters, yes, there are some still difficulties. The fact that the US pulled out from TPP is not just an economic matter. It has a regional strategic implication as well, so that's a big concern for us. And the uh, sort of the prospect of bilateral sort of free trade agreement with the US, that remains to be a, a difficult task. But in general, especially on the military and sort of national security front, you have the MMTs, right? the Mattis, McMaster, and Tillerson, who has a firm grip on that agenda. Uh, and even on trade matters, you know, Mr. Pence, who does understand that America needs to be connected. He was for TPP initially, of course he is not now. And as a governor, he sort of uh, brought in many Japanese uh, uh, you know, business into Indiana. So it's good that he does understand that America has to be connected. So as a result of all this, there's a sort of a cautious optimism in Japan. And if you ask the Japanese people, you know, this, this meeting with uh, uh, Abe and Trump in February, is it, was, was, the, was the meeting good? The 70% of the Japanese public said it had a very positive effect on US-Japan relations. So like I said, you know, not, not just among the leaders, but as in general, the Japanese has, has uh, sort of uh, decided to uh, adapt rather than to sort of complain. But the question is, was that the right choice? And why did we have to do so? Uh, like I said, Japan faces issues on Korean Peninsula. Uh, they're thre threatening us with uh, nuclear weapons and, and missiles. Uh, we have the uncertain rise of China. And if you add up what China is doing, and, and I have to sort of stress that China is also a possibility for us. But if you add what China is doing, you see a possibility of a emerging uh, sort of China-centric order. And our firm conviction is that that kind of leader, uh, uh, order is not good for our region. Uh, you know, the, 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 at the root of, uh, of our success and the region's success, I think it was a liberal international order which was upheld by the American sort of uh, presence and sort of many other sort of uh, you know, institutions that supported that. So you know, it, 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 you know, there's a firm conviction on our side that, that uh, you know, we would sort of complicate China's hegemonic ambition sort of in defense of liberal international order. But the question is, how do we do that? And let me engage in some intellectual exercise and try out some possible options for Japan. Now, there's a talk about Japan becoming a normal nation, becoming a full-blown military power, maybe even go nuclear. But is that really possible? I don't think it's not. There's no support in Japan. We don't have the money to do so. And even the region does not sort of welcome that. Yes, Japan is going to a direction where we would sort of expand our role in these uh, military affairs. But that's far from Japan becoming a full-blown military nation. So that's, that's not a viable option to sort of uh, uh, you know, complicate China's hegemonic rise. And what about sort of fully embracing China as we embrace the United States? Uh, or sort of uh, uh, test out the pacifism that we, we, we have in our constitution. But Japan is, is you know, for Japan to totally disarm and, and sort of uh, you know, praise pacifism is a very irresponsible act. It would create a security vacuum and become a source of conflict. So pacifism is not a real, realistic option either. Do we have a regional organization that we can trust? We don't have any. We have many talk shop. They are all important, but it's far from becoming a sort of a viable security organization. Can we rely on global institutions like the UN? Yes, of course the UN is important. But on critical issues that is related to Northeast Asia, you see who's in the uh, Security Council uh, from Northeast Asia with a veto power, it's China. So it doesn't quite work out for us. Uh, is there any other alliance options? Yes, we are trying to sort of beef up our security relations with Australia, India. Korea is always a difficult partner, but we're trying to sort of improve that. But it does not sort of uh, replace the relations we have with the United States. So the answer is simple. You know, it's the only option but it's the best options, uh, option for Japan. 
it may not be the most you know, sophisticated argument, but it's the most you know, convincing option. And in sort of uh, you know, national security matters, you know, sophistication is not, not the issue. I think uh, you know, being realistic, US-Japan alliance remains to be the best option for Japan. Are we fully sort of uh, you know satisfied? Are we are we fully sort of uh, you know comfortable with that? You know there are worries. Uh, if you look at the uh, you know uh, the state of you know foreign policy team uh, of the Trump administration, uh, you know you don't see the Asia team being fully sort of uh, sort of formulated. State Department itself seem to be mar marginalized, and you don't have sort of a comprehensive Asia Pacific policy yet. You you seem to like uh, seem to sort of like reacting. To events, and most of all, you know, U.S.-Japan alliance is not a standalone institution. Uh, yes, we hear right messages about the alliance, but you know, uh, U.S.-Japan alliance has to sort of uh, resonate and synchronize with the Asia-Pacific policy of Japan, and and if it, that's not there, that makes us a bit worried as well. Uh, if if you look at the recent, sorry for citing the Pew uh, poll. But you know, if you cite the Pew poll, uh, you know, confidence, no confidence race, ratio towards Mr. Trump in Japan is 24 and 72. And that number is quite shocking too. It's not a convincing number. But whatever this number means, uh, America remains uh, Japan's only option and the best option. And, uh, but you know, just telling the American people, and especially people who support Trump, that you know, U.S.-Japan alliance is the best option for Japan doesn't, of course, convince them. So uh, you know, you'd have to also understand that U.S.-Japan alliance is also totally in sync with American national interest as well. If you look around the globe, you know, there are many issues, you know, uh, you know, and, and there are many important regions uh, for the United States because U.S. is a global power. But Middle East, there's lots of issues that you have to deal with. It's, it's mostly about dealing with, with problems. Uh, yes, Africa is a rising region, but we have to wait for a while to fully sort of enjoy, uh, you know, uh, the, sort of the developments in Africa. Yes, of course, Europe, you have a, a sort of deep and, and, and firm historical relations with Europe. Uh, you know, they make good wines, the cheese is fine, museums and all that. Uh, I, love, I love going to Europe. But is Europe the dynamic sort of center of world economy? Uh, it is not. Uh, so if you look around the region, the region where there is a most dynamic sort of a possibility is, is East Asia. Uh, not only China, but East Asia as a whole. And you have to remember that America has constantly been a resident power of, uh, of this region. Since the beginning of the 20th century, you have been a functional part, although not a physical part, a functional part of Asia in terms of economy, politics, and national security and all that. Uh, uh, but the thing is, you're not physically there. Right? So you need a good partner. Uh, and, and I guess this is where US and Japan sort of meet. You can pick any potential sort of partners in the Asia Pacific. You have Philippines, you have South Korea, you have Singapore, uh, Australia, Taiwan. They're all important. But look at what's going on in the uh, Philippines. You have uh, you know, outbursts of anti-Americanism in South Korea uh, once in a while. Uh, so you know, partnering up with Japan makes sense. You know, Japan is a stable democracy, has a very developed market economy. In terms of values and political system, we share that with the United States. We host the American forces in a major way. And the important thing is that we don't have this anti-American sort of social movement, a significant one in Japan. Yes, there are uh, issues in Okinawa where they host the bases, but there are no national sort of anti-American sentiment in Japan. And the last uh, uh, period when we saw that was back in the 60s or maybe the early 70s. Right? So this alliance has the 60 years of good record. And yes, the alliance was a product of the Cold War, but we have successfully sort of transformed that to a post-Cold War institution. Uh, and there's a sort of wide shared understanding in Asia Pacific that this US-Japan alliance is the bedrock of peace and security of the region. So, you know, I'm, I'm sounding like a bad car salesman or something. But, you know, the difference is that I'm selling a good product, you know, rather than a bad car. So I think, you know, it's, it's, it's even a best choice for the United States. So, you know, facing 
Trump administration. What we have to do fundamentally does not change. You know, doubling down on the alliance and, and, and convincing the United States that you have to be a resident power uh, in this region. And I think we can sort of, con you know, I think the region expects us to do that, okay, to convince the Americans that you have to be a resident power. Uh, from an American standpoint, maybe our understanding of uh, you know the Trump administration might be uh, too optimistic. Uh, you know the you know the structural unpredictability is is part of uh, you know uh, the the Trump uh, sort of foreign policy. Uh, you know what would happen after the MMT? Maybe you can add sort of age to it. Ambassador Haley is uh, is performing uh, quite, uh, you know uh, uh, you know wonderfully in the United Nations. But what if they're gone, right? And, and you know, what about uh, Kerry, the uh, 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 chief of staff, who seems to be in, in control? But what if he's out? You know, there, there are worries. But our response is that, you know, it's the president you chose. We can't do anything about it. So, and in, in view of the importance of the US-Japan alliance, whoever uh, the, the president is, our decision, decision was to embrace him fully. So, you know, as a conclusion, you know, even in the Trump era, the fundamentals of Japan does not change. Uh, focus on or even double down on what we have been doing so far. And I guess this is the real, realism for Japan in the Trump era. So I thank you for that. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you. This is very interesting. Uh, I'll kick it off. You know, you started your remarks by saying that you had lost your students' trust yeah. by, by getting the election wrong. I'll, I'll give you a second chance. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> you know, uh, in, in Japan, Prime Minister has been in some, a little bit of trouble. He's got lagging approval rates. And if we're right. talking about making Japan's foreign policy, mm -hmm. one year from now, will Prime Minister Abe still be making Japan's foreign policy? Well, he has been Prime Minister since uh, 2000. Well, the, the end of 2012. Mm -hmm. right? So that's a long time for a Japanese prime minister. Because after Prime Minister Koizumi, we had like an annual change of leadership. And, you know, one uh, American friend jokingly said that Japan is the most safe failed nation on earth. <laughs> if you compare to that, you know, Prime Minister Abe's of leadership has been quite remarkable. But it's been a long time. And, and I do agree that there's some sense of fatigue towards uh, Prime Minister Abe. And there's a bit of a worry about, you know, uh, you know where he's going on sort of national security matters and all that. So in a recent Tokyo Metropolitan Council election, the LDP, which is his party, lost in a major way. Mm -hmm. that, that's true. But at the same time, uh, you know, there's a sense in Japan that Japan is in a very dangerous part of the world. Is there a viable leader who the Japanese public can really trust. We have an opposing party, uh, the De Democratic Party. They've recently had a, a change in leadership. But the trust in the uh, uh, Democratic Party is staggeringly low. Right? So if you think about the other options, do you see any sort of challenger in the Liberal Democratic Party? You don't. So yes, there are some fatigue in Japan, but I think uh, generally I would say that uh, you know, because of the fact that there are no other sort of viable options and the fact that we're in a very dangerous part of the world, I think uh, people are not fully happy, but basically in support of you know, Prime Minister Abe and uh, his strong leadership. And when I was, I was in South Korea just after the, the elections in, in the U.S., and you know, there was a bit of a, a Trump shock. Everyone was kind right. of getting adjusted. And, and one thing that came out repeatedly in the meetings was that in some ways they were somewhat excited. Uh, mm. Excited might be the wrong word, but they thought that... In a positive way? In a positive way that, that he was going to come in and shake things up. 
-hmm. He has come in and shake things up, and if I go back and talk to them now, I'm going to find probably that they're not quite happy with the way that he's, uh, he's shaken things up. But you know, it, there was a sense that a Trump administration would provide some kind of opportunity mm -hmm. for, for change. Right. I'm wondering if a Trump administration, in your opinion, provides opportunity for Japan. You mentioned this kind of this leadership vacuum. If, if there is an opportunity for leadership from Japan, where is it and how can Japan best make use of it? Well, in a way, you know, there's a, you know, Japan is a democracy. We, we don't have a full consensus, right? But I think there's a general consensus that U.S.-Japan alliance is critically important. So rather than seeing a, uh, you know, a positive side, you know, there were a, a big, like I said in my, in my box, there are huge worries in Japan, uh, in Japan about what would happen to the alliance in the Trump era. But on the sort of the right wing fringe, you know, we have our own nationalists, right? And there, uh, for Japan becoming a sort of full-blown military power. And to realize that vision, maybe U.S. pulling back might be a good news. Hasn't, hasn't Prime Minister Abe already started down this road? I know it's not been a huge jump, but it's been an incremental mm -hmm. step towards that. Well, but it's not prompted by Mr. Trump. Mm -hmm. It was a sure. sort of a decision even before that, right? right? And, and it doesn't do much to do with the United States either. It's as a major power in the region. And if you think about the actual threats that we're facing, what does Japan has to do? What does Japan have to do? Mm -hmm. that, you know, the actions that Prime Minister Abe uh, has undertook was you know, a, a conclu conclusion of that sort of you know, question. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, it, it's not directly related to Mr. Trump. But I would say that there's a sense of worry. And you know, this may be controversial, but we like controversy, so but, please you know, go ahead. I see a certain continuity uh, among, uh, between President Obama and President Trump to a certain degree. How so? Although you know, the way things appear is totally different, mm -hmm. I understand. And the two presidents are totally different. That I understand, too. But if you sort of condense the, you know, Mr. Trump's message, the foreign policy message, is that you know, we're not going to do this humanitarian intervention stuff. We're not going to do nation building. Mm -hmm. That's the first pillar. And the second pillar is we're going to ask allies to do more. Right? And the third is f we're going to focus on domestic things. And this is precisely what President Obama said as well. And you know, the, the motivation behind that is different. But you know, the fact that these two messages were basically supported by the American people shows that there is a certain sort of uh, uh, a degree of continuity. Uh, maybe you can call that a retrenchment, a, a tendency toward retrenchment. I'm not saying America is sort of going, uh, going fully, fully into you know, isolationism, but the sense of retrenchment or foreign, foreign policy begins at home kind of you know, a feeling is, is quite strong. And there's a sense in Japan that maybe we have to keep that in mind and maybe we have to do more. And when we're trying to convince the Americans that you have to be a resident power in this region, at least we can say we're doing the maximum within our uh, uh, legal framework. So that is partly the motivation. And so convincing America to be a, a resident power, um, I think, is going to leads to this idea that you're going to perpetuate this uh, dual hierarchy system. That you know the U.S. is kind of the the central security power there, and China is the central economic power. Is this dual hierarchy? Do you think this is sustainable? And if not, then what is the outcome if it's not sustainable? Well, if you look at what China is doing, they're not sort of content on remaining an economic power. There, uh, we see uh, their sort of hegemonic ambitions in terms of you know territory, in terms of influence, and and I said in my remarks that Japan thinks that China-centric order is not good for the region. But there's other side to it. There's a sense in our region, and especially among the small and you know, mid-sized countries, that you can't do much about China's rise, nor shape China's rise. Right? So you might as well adapt to it than confront it. So in a way, Japan is the only country in the region who is explicitly saying 
that China-centric order is not good for the region, and we're not going to accept it. Right? So that makes us, and I'm, I'm being a bit sentimental here, but in that sense, we're, we're, we feel a bit lonely. Yes, on specific issues, you see some countries resisting China, like Vietnam, and Philippines before Duterte, but if you see a China-centric order, it might be even logical for a smaller nations to adapt to it and to challenge it. So in that sense, maybe not Japan, but, but I feel a bit lonely. Right? So if you make this kind of argument in you know, conferences in you know, Asia Pacific, all these countries will say, yeah, you're making the right point in the hallways. But when we gather in the main conference room, when we, we make that point, they would sort of you know, <laughs> sit down and stay quiet. So that kind of loneliness we feel. So that's why uh, you know, our relations with, with the United States and the fact that US, the US has to be a resident power is a critical component of uh, Japan's foreign policy. And we're going to open it up to the, the audience now. You'll notice we've left a lot of the bilateral issues still on the table. North Korea has barely been touched. South Korea has barely been touched. So I hope there are our questions, and we'll, we'll queue them up. First, we'll come down here in front, uh, Ivo. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks for being here, and, and thanks for a really interesting talk. Uh, uh, I'll take you up in your provocation uh, of the Obama administration and Trump administration having a similar view. And on all three points, you're right. I would also say in terms of the commit recommitment to the Security Alliance, uh, both presidents have been very strong in their, in their verbal commitments to that. One big difference, which in some ways strategically has altered the landscape quite remarkably, is TPP. And on the Obama administration's commitment to use TPP as a glue for its own presence, uh, and the decision by the Trump administration to not pursue that uh, from a geostrategic or economic side, how do you recapture that, you know, given that that TPP has fallen away, how do you recapture that element of the glue not only between the United States and, and the countries, uh, the other uh, members of TPP, but Japan as a leader within using TPP as a way to establish a, you know, a different set of order that was behind it in the beginning. Can I go one by one? Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you, <coughs> Ambassador, for that uh, great question. Uh, I totally agree, TPP is a major difference. But I, I, I would also say that from a Japanese uh, point of view, you know, we were a bit late in becoming you know, a player in TPP, but President Obama could have started TPP a bit earlier. So we, we welcome the pivot message, but it was always unclear what it really was. It was always a mixed message. Sometimes it was about military, Pres uh, Vice President Biden said in Singapore that it was about culture, whatever that meant. And sometimes it's about economy. And it was perceived very sort of differently in, in Asia. China thought it was a con China containment policy. And in Japan, it, we, we thought it was an alliance policy. So yes, I think it was a s right set of policies, but it, it lacked the priorities, what was the most important core. But the, at the end of the administration, we started hearing that you know, TPP was at the core. It, it, it shows Americans of, America's commitment to the region. So therefore, the fact that uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Trump decided to sort of uh, drop out from the TPP was quite significant. But you know, he was in the groove. You know, it was a day after the, the inauguration or something. And it, it wasn't like you know, uh, getting rid of NAFTA, which is already there. So I think the Japanese government's position was that you can't really can do anything about TPP and, 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 and in, in the context of convincing Mr. Trump. So I think we maybe you know, we talked about the importance of TPP, but we, we really never fully tried to convince the importance of TPP because we, we thought it was just impossible. But the, the decision of the Japanese government was to sort of 
put TPP on life support. And in fact, there is a, a, a discussion on TPP 11, that is a TPP without the United States. And with Australia and New Zealand and Japan, right, these three countries are trying to sort of a, uh, put TPP on a life support and wait for a time when US would come back. And the reason why we're doing that is because TPP is not just a, you know, a, you know, a, a mega free trade arrangement. It is. But it, it extends more than that. I think it would sort of be a sort of a, you know, a fundamental sort of layer of liberal international order in Asia Pacific. You know, countries like Japan and the United States would share values, trying to sort of establish a high spec trade order which is not just about sort of pure trade, it has implications on labor rights, environment and all that. And that would sort of put a soft pressure, not contain or in, in any way, soft pressure in China. And China can deal with you know, bilateral economic arrangement, right? But sort of multilateral sort of trade ar arrangement sort of surrounding China, that would create you know, uh, difficulties for China. So, TPP, in a way, was a strategic arrangement for Japan. You know, smaller countries don't see it that way, but at least Japan and U.S. saw TPP as that. So the fact that U.S. and, and, and Trump administration decided to drop out of the TPP was a major blow to sort of our image of American commitment in the region. But like I said at the beginning, can you convince Mr. Trump to uh, pick TPP? We decided that it wasn't. So we stop doing that, but focus on TPP-11 and wait for you know, America to sort of return to that arrangement. And with, with the discussion on economics, I think we have a question from our in-house economist, our senior fellow for the economy, Phil. Hi, thank you very much for your comments, uh, Phil Vivier, senior fellow of the global economy. Um, I want to follow up on this. Your, your points about TPP are very well taken. The Trump administration has expressed a strong preference for bilateral deals sure. as opposed to multilateral. You mentioned that this could be sort of difficult. I think that was a bit of understatement. Um, so how should we interpret Prime Minister Abe's comments on this? Because at one level, I think when he was presented with the idea of doing a bilateral, which means that that's very interesting, is this standard politeness, the, you know, the minimum that one says, or is there any serious consideration being given to pursuing a bilateral deal with the U.S.? Well, uh, you know, I, I think a, a government official can answer that, or you know, the Japanese position, I would say. But as, you know, I'm not in any way representing the Japanese government, but I would say that they're extremely worried. But here, you know, Japanese bureaucracy is known for delaying tactic, maybe. But surely, you know, we understand the priorities of the Trump administration. So something would have to start. Right? So we came out with this Pence ASO framework, which is that the bilaterals of trade agreement would be dealt by these two leaders and try to sort of engage in a rational argument. Not that Mr. Trump is irrational all the time. But, uh, uh, so, but this process hasn't really, they met uh, uh, once, I think, but it hasn't sort of fully kicked in. And that may be a good sign for Japan. Uh, uh, but, but yes. Uh, we understand the priority of the Trump administration, and we can't just, just push back and say no. But uh, uh, for Japan, I think TPP makes much more sense because of the strategic significance and the fact that you know, multilateral arrangement has a bigger effect as well. Yeah, here in the middle. Thanks. Um, you know, even talking about TPP 11 and waiting for something uh, better, one, I'd like to know what exactly people in Japan think they're waiting for, whether it's the next president or this president to change his mind. But that, that seems to be praying for the best. Is there any preparation for the worst? Is there, is there a point, is there a threshold 
where you think an American-led liberal order is not going to come back to the region, and what's the alternative? Is, is Japan thinking of alternatives? Because you spoke forcefully about uh, confronting a China-led region. If America, no, I, I said we're not confronting, not or adapting to, to it. Complicate and, China. Uh, yeah, uh, but what would be the anchor for that strategy if if it's not America? Well, you know, I don't have a, in a way, I don't have an answer to that because it's not my issue, it's your issue. It's the issue that America would face. It's your choice whether you would support a president or a leader who would be sort of engaged or who would be sort of detached. Uh, but when, but I, 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 I firmly believe that uh, there's a certain sort of trend in the United States. And I can understand if you ask an average American, you know, I'm going to South Dakota after this right, and try to sort of talk about U.S. Japan alliance and America's commitment to Asia Pacific. It would be very difficult for a sort of ordinary sort of, uh, you know, people in South Dakota to fully support America's full blown commitment to a full-blown liberal international order. It's quite natural that they want their, you know, your leaders to focus more on domestic matters. So, and, and I see a continuing trend, and not, this is, like I said, this is not just President Trump. I think this has been more or less constant. 9-11 changed that to a certain degree because it was a huge shock but even before that, you had this kind of you know, lingering sort of retrenchment tendency. So there's a sense in Japan that, you know, yes, U.S.-Japan alliance remains to be the pillar of Japan's uh, security policy, but maybe we have to think beyond. But beyond doesn't mean getting sort of rid of the U.S.-Japan alliance or anything like that. It's 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 the the discussion that we've had that it's a decision by the by the Japanese leaders and Japanese public that we have to play a more proactive role in in sort of uh, national security matters. Uh, and I don't think America is going to sort of become a you know, a full isolationist power because it just simply doesn't make sense, and it stops make America from being great. So. In a way, this may be a learning process that America has to engage in to a certain degree. Maybe a different kind of engagement, because in a way, the international engagement, a global engagement during the Cold War was an anomaly. So maybe we're, in a certain way, returning to a normalcy. But the normalcy you're facing is a very hyper-connected world that American isolationism is simply not the answer. And by the way, there's no support from the American public for uh, American, American isolationism. isolationism right. as, as, well. your as our, our survey show. Right, yeah. Um, yeah, down here. Thank you very much for your comments. Um, my question is what percentage of Japanese GDP is put toward defense? Uh, relative to, to their GDP. In NATO, a country is supposed to place it somewhere between 2 and 4 percent. And then overall, what percentage of your defense is dependent on American sources of financing? What was, what's the last part? Uh, what, uh, what amount of your defense spending is borne by the United States contributions? I don't have the precise number for that, but on the f first part, uh, it's uh, low, 1%. And I think we should sort of uh, increase that. 2% uh, would be, I think, the right amount. But uh, it's, it's difficult, of course. Uh, and. Do we feel, you know, some kind of pressure uh, 
as you know, the, the European countries are feeling pressure from the United States, do we, uh, do we have that kind of pressure? No. Uh, because the arrangement of US-Japan alliance is that, that we host a major American mm -hmm. base in Japan. And uh, you know, that's a significant part of you know, US sort of forward deployment in, in Asia Pacific. I mean, without that, this American forward deployment doesn't, doesn't make sense and it doesn't work. So that part of the contribution is uh, welcomed by the military. But I'm sure uh, you know, the uh, increase in defense budget would be welcomed in Washington. And uh, at least in the, uh, sort of the national security com community, there is an argument and a near consensus that Japan has to do more and uh, spend more. And recently, Prime Minister Abe said he intends he, to, correct? He, but he hasn't he, yet he released a new to. budget. But it's a gradual process. Right. And still, I would say that you know, Japan is a very, uh, I would say, a religious country. We have our own sort of a belief system. Uh, you know, but the closest thing we have to a religion in the post-war Japan is the peace constitution. Right? So a constitutional scholar is, you know, I, I jokingly often say that, they're like a guardians of the sacred text. And whenever we start talking about constitutional reform and revisions, you know, Article 9, which is the peace clause, uh, you know, and national security experts, and IR scholars try to jump in. These you know, guardians of the sacred text would, sort of, would direct us that you're not supposed to talk about it because you're not the guardians of the sacred. So we are in a lower class of you know, scholars. Right? Mm -hmm. So this, this civic religion in, in, in Japan, this fascism, although it's not an ideology, it's more of a sentiment, it's quite strong. So whenever we talk about these issues, Japan sort of expanding uh, you know, our security roles and trying to sort of increase our uh, defense budget, that kind of, sort of sentiment kicks in and, and complicates the issue. So it, it's going to be a slow process, but I assure you Japan is going towards that direction. But as, as with all things related to Japan, it tends to be slow. But it tends to be in the right direction as well. And, and I would point out on the second part of your question, we're talking about what's borne by the U.S. You know, it's, it's significant. I think the general cost would be roughly $4 billion um, total, but Japan actually contributes $2 billion to that. So they often say that it's actually cheaper to station troops in Japan than it is to keep them here in the U.S. So in, in all in all, it's a relatively uh, good deal. I think we have, we have time for one last question from the audience. Yes, back here. Is freedom of the seas an important issue in the U.S.-Japanese uh, alliance because China's trying to claim nearby waters as its own territory? Yeah, so free freedom of the seas is important. Right. Is there, I guess the question is, is there room for cooperation in the South China Sea for the U.S. and Japan? The U.S. is already doing freedom of navigation mm -hmm. uh, exercises there. Is that something Japan can cooperate in? And also, would you welcome South Korea's participation in, in those? Well, uh, our sort of uh, general purpose is the same, that rule of law has to be respected, and the change of status quo uh, by sort of exerting sort of uh, power is not acceptable. But the way we actually sort of contribute <coughs> in sort of uh, uh, maintaining that kind of order is a bit different, I would say. Uh, we try to sort of uh, beef up the, the sort of the capabilities of countries in that region, in particular Philippines or Vietnam. You know, they're a you know, Coast Guard sort of a capability. So we're very much forward leaning on that front. And whether we could do, you know, the, the front off the freedom of navigation together with the U.S., you know, there's been talk about it. Uh, but it hasn't been realized. I think it's, personally, I think it's okay. Uh, and in fact, you know, UK and other countries in Europe are interested in sort of, you know, being involved. Uh, operating with uh, uh, South Korea, I'm not 
quite sh sure whether that kind of discussion is going on. Uh, we tend to focus on Korean Peninsula. We uh, when we talk about uh, we, when we talk with our Korean friends, uh, but, but but sure, I mean you know, uh, Korea and Japan is is both an important and good allies uh, to uh, to the United States. So it makes sense that uh, you know Japan and ROK involved in a regional effort. But unfortunately. Uh, First of all, we're pre preoccupied with Korean Peninsula, mm -hmm. but there are some delicate historical issues. You know, you have to hear the Korean perspective as well, but from a Japanese perspective on the Korean side, uh, that hinders those kind of uh, cooperation. Whereas we're willing to do it. Mm -hmm. So, but you know, in, in dealing sort of everything uh, related to Northeast Asia, yes, we we we, we have good relations with. Uh, U.S. Japan, uh, the United States. The missing link always is our relations with uh, South Korea, and I think we have to work on that. <clears throat> right, we will take one last question down in front. The the woman sitting right in front. In light of the new or ongoing nuclear tests that North Korea has made, and their ballistic missiles, uh, what is the sense of the Japanese public, and particularly the younger people, as to what that means to Japan? Well, uh, this is not a new challenge for us. It's been going on. It seems like Japan is only interested in pressuring uh, North Korea. But we tried dialogue. Uh, engaging North Korea a couple of times. It didn't work. Uh, Prime Minister Koizumi uh, went to Pyongyang and they had a sort of a agreement with the uh, North Korean. It's, it was a leader to leader agreement that if, it's, if there was a development on the nuclear development front, missile development, uh, missile uh, sort of front, and the human rights front, because we have the abduction issue between DPRK. They abducted Japanese citizens. But there was no development on, on any of those sort of issues. So there's a sense that in Japan, uh, in light of the fact that the challenge and the threat level has been rising in past year or so, although this, it has been a constant challenge, there's a sense in Japan that more sort of pressure has to be exerted towards North Korea. But of course, at a certain point, some kind of a talk has to be initiated. But at least, uh, this is not the moment. And <clears throat> among the younger generation, I don't know whether there's a specific younger generation's uh, uh, position or attitudes toward North Korea. But I would say in general that you know, you know, people talk about rise of nationalism in East Asia. Know, in China, in South Korea, and in Japan as well. But you know, talking to students in the university, I sense the totally opposite. It's focusing on their private lives. And I worry about it. I want them to be even more nationalistic to a certain degree. So and you know, so I don't see uh, a specific younger generation's response toward North Korea. Maybe they might be a bit indifferent. They, maybe they're used to it because the North Korean threat has been there you know, since they were born. Because it's been going on for more than 20 years. So, yeah. Does that answer your question? You know, it's, it's been an interesting conversation, I think. You know, in, in a lot of ways, Prime Minister Abe has, has become kind of the envy of East Asia, the fact that when there is a test, when something goes wrong, the very first person that's on the phone right. with President Trump is Prime Minister Abe. I know that he's certainly the envy of the South Koreans, who can't seem to get him on the phone uh, when, when they need to. Um, but you know, overall, I think there's, it's, it's really interesting that this does present a, an interesting leadership opportunity for Japan. You mentioned kind of complicating China's hegemonic uh, you know, Ambitions, right. ambitions uh, as a role for Japan to play. And I would also offer that there's a great opportunity in Southeast Asia mm -hmm. where there's the, the game is, is sort of afoot. Japan is already very active there. 
the U.S. has pulled back, and I think there's a good, good way that Japan can start to, to lead uh, the United States to also become active there, perhaps not under this administration, but uh, at least in, in the future. And I think right now it looks like the, the relationship is, is headed certainly in the right direction. Professor Nakayama, thank you for joining us and, and for thank your you. remarks. Thank you very much.